first of all, I, w I would like to say that I'm absolutely delighted and honoured to be here today among uh, Samson's friends uh, from a long time, I realise. I mean, I've known you for a long time too. Yes, I think we met uh, between 89 and 91 in Chicago, where I just moved from Europe for my, uh, one of my postdocs before going to Durham in England. And I vividly remember the lively conversations that we had, especially at lunchtime with Jeff, <laughs> about physics, of course, but also about politics. Yes, and uh, I th Jeff also just moved. He had just moved, yes, and indeed, the, the anecdote is that I, I was a young postdoc and uh, everybody told me, you are going to Chicago, but Friedan and Schenker have, have left. Uh, remember, this is going to be dead territory there. And then, of course, I said, fine, I mean, I'll go anyway. And then I arrived, surprise, Jeff was there and you were there. And uh, Iwoshi also was there for a while. <coughs> yes, so it was great times. And uh, since then, I think we have met in many, many places, sometimes unexpectedly, yes, uh, but always with great pleasure. Right, so, right, so my talk today, um, is uh, covering uh, several works that I've uh, done with Catherine Wendland, who is uh, my long-time uh, collaborator, uh, certainly since 2010. You can see a little bit of a timeline there. So uh, all started really just before I met Samson, uh, when I was in Paris, actually, at the Ecole Normale, and Eguchi, Toru Eguchi, uh, was a visitor for a year, and I was a postdoc there for a year, and we started talking about N equals four superconformal algebras in two dimensions. And we worked out the representation theory, uh, unitary representations of these uh, superconformal algebras, and we stumbled against a new phenomenon that at the time uh, we couldn't deal with, uh, is that the characters, unlike what happened for other uh, uh, superconformal uh, algebras at n equals 2, uh, had no regime where the theory is rational. And this was the very first instance that we discovered many years later of a phenomenon that has to do with mock <coughs> modular forms, which have been developed by Zagier and Zweigers uh, in the 2000s, right? So uh, we were a bit in the dark, so we published whatever we could, we calculated the elliptic genus uh, of the K3 surface by these methods. And in, as you will see in the talk, uh, in doing so, we came up with some numbers that uh, became uh, extremely interesting in 2010. So that's why I've put 2010 there, so we'll see why. And then since then, with Katrin in particular, we have followed uh, a very specific line of investigation to try to understand these numbers in the context of string theory. Right. So the plan of the talk is uh, to, to remind or to tell you what the elliptic genus of K3 is and what it counts. It counts in particular what I've called quarter BPS states. I will tell you what this is. And then I will introduce this mysterious phenomenon that has to do with the numbers I was mentioning before, which is called Mathieu Moonshine. And then I will go on and uh, look a little bit closer to K3 theories that I will define and tell you what I mean by generic and non-generic K3 theories and why it's important in understanding what's going on. And then one particular type of uh, non-generic uh, K3 theories are uh, Z2 or befores of toroidal conformal field theories. Right? And these ones uh, give you a very practical way, hands-on way, to try to explore uh, the nature of these states uh, that, that are counted by these magic numbers. And finally, I, I will conclude with a hope, because the problem is not solved, it's still uh, open, but uh, Catherine in particular has spent a little bit of time into studying refinements of the elliptic genus that uh, started the story there. And this, uh, we think, uh, might be very helpful in understanding the Mathieu Moonshine phenomenon beyond the mathematical reality of it, which is proven, by the way. So mathematically, we understand what the structure is, but we don't know what on earth <coughs> and this sporadic group that I'm going to talk about, which is Mathieu 24, that's why there's a Mathieu there, uh, comes into string theory. Right. 
So to set the scene a little bit, I just want to define what uh, my framework of theories is. These are two-dimensional superconformer field theories, and I take the unitary case here, which possess uh, n equals 2,2 where she is supersymmetry, but also space-time supersymmetry, and the space-time supersymmetry is actually, uh, let's say, uh, induced by the fact that you have a U1 in dn equals 2 superconformal algebra and then the spectral flow generator helps defining the generator of supersymmetry in space-time. And we look at theories which have the central charge in the left sector and the right sector which coincide, which are equal, and which are quantized in units of 3, so 3 times d, where d, capital D there, will end up being the dimension of the manifolds, the target manifolds in the non-linear sigma models uh, that uh, play a central role here. The space of states of these theories is this uh, capital H there. You have a neville schwarz and the Ramon sector. So this is both left and right here. So there are the boundary conditions that dictate what is in neville schwarz within Ramon. And then in particular, I'm not saying that all the conditions and all the axioms for superconformal field theory in two dimensions are on the board there, but only the important ones for today, is that we have four uh, zero-mode uh, operators there, J0, J bar 0, T0, which you see is a topological twist, T0 minus half J0, and T bar 0 uh, there, which commute, which are self-adjoint, diagonalizable, and which are uh, semi-definite positive for T0 and T0 bar. This algebra, algebra is enhanced, right, for, to a duck algebra for, for special D. It is indeed. And That's very nice. soon, yeah. and very soon I'm going to set D equals to 2, because this is a Calabia two-fold uh, hyperkähler K3. And so, that would be a duck, is Sorry? That, that would be a duck algebra, the bigger one. No, that, I'm, I'm going to talk about, well, the, the enhancement, if you have a spectral flow which has a, um, a what, um, is, is the n equals 4 superconformal algebra? Uh, Odake is, is, is c equals 9, isn't it? Well, I don't know if you call it. Oh, you call it like this. Never called it like this. For me, it's c equals 9. Oh. No, okay, never mind. But I, I, we are on the same it's wavelength. Yeah, yeah. Well, I call this algebra n equals 4 here. Okay. okay? Um, right. So, what's important uh, for later is a part of the partition function of these theories, which are in the so-called Ramon twisted sector. So the full partition functions of Neville Schwartz and Ramon and twisted Neville Schwartz and twisted Ramon. But if we concentrate on that particular sector, what we do is that we take a supertrace. Now I've written it in different ways here uh, because I'm going to jump from actually use more this formulation here, but because usually people see the partition function in that sector written like this, where we keep track of the um, quantum numbers associated with uh, the uh, T0 operator, no, not T0 yet, L0 in this language, so the Viazo, so the energy essentially, and this one uh, which keeps track of, of the U1 quantum number in both left and right sector, in the S here, I've hidden this operator that I've explicitly written in the second line here, which basically counts bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom with a sign. So if you have uh, n bosons and n fermions, uh, then because of this super trace, they cancel in the counting. So you are losing, we will see what happens later on. So in the partition function, it's just counting with a sign there. Because of the properties of the partition function, you have restriction on the spectrum of these operators there, which I will uh, use as well. And it's a beautiful uh, automorphic uh, form, this partition function here. You see that under the S modular transformation, which links Z, sorry, tau, N minus one over tau, uh, it's not one here, but uh, it has a nice behavior anyway, where the central charge plays a role. Right, so, if now we take this partition function that I just showed you and we set the y bar, so the u1, what was keeping track of the u1 on the right hand side on the bar, 
Then we have a definition of what the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus of such theories is. And this is the first line here. And I've chosen to use uh, the trace over the Neuve-Schwartz states here, where now you see that I've put T0 here and not L0. Right. Now it turns out that because of supersymmetry, many of these states in the trace here, once you put y bar is equal to 1, uh, are going to cancel. And what you are left with is only a trace over the kernel of this operator here. So from here to here, I have implemented uh, a consequence of supersymmetry. And uh, this, this object is, in, is an invariant because since I restrict to zero eigenvalues of t bar zero, and I told you that the spectrum of t bar zero minus t zero in the previous transparency is an integer, so it means that t zero here uh, is going to have integer values and therefore it's going to be producing an invariant because you can't smoothly deform it, it stays a, 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 an integer number. And now if you look carefully at these type of expressions in these theories, you see that because now y bar being one, there is a whole set of states inside here that are going to cancel uh, in, in the right sector, in the bar sector, because there will be some which are fermions and some which are bosons, and a certain number will just cancel each other. So basically the elliptic genus uh, gives you less information than the partition function, of course, and what's important is that you can now rephrase it as an invariant where you trace now under a subspace of Kerr T0 bar here. And this space here is going to be just what I call a generic space of states. So these are the states that, that stay after the, can the cancellations I've just talked about. And this uh, is going to be a very important space uh, to make hopefully progress with this program. So the uh, elliptic genus here uh, expressed uh, in terms of Jacobi theta function is something that we calculated a long time ago with conformal field theory techniques. And I should say what I was ex talking to, to Samson about a minute ago is that I will most of my talk re restrict to what I call a K3 theory, which is one of the previous general theories that I defined before, but taking the center charge c equals 6, but of course at c equals 6 you have n equals 4 supersymmetry, superconformal symmetries that we know, but we have two classes of theories, we have tori and we have k3 theories. The tori have an elliptic genus which is zero, trivial, and of course if you have this elliptic genus then you know that you have a k3 theory. Now there are some subtleties about k3 theories that it's widely believed that all K3 theories are realizable as nonlinear sigma models uh, on the K3 surface, but it's not proven mathematically. But of course, I will always <laughs> uh, refer to the nonlinear sigma model in my talk. Right. So, because we have an n equals 4 super supersymmetry there, it's possible to decompose the uh, elliptic genus into n equals 4 characters, the, the characters that we computed with Eguchi a long time ago at the ELNS. Right? And when you do, and we did, did, we did that at the time, and we came with this type of uh, expression. Now, today, this is not going to be my concern at all, but it's because actually we are even more in the dark about the interpretation of this sector of the elliptic genus than we are about this one. Uh, but these are characters, unitary uh, characters of n equals 4 for short representations or massless representations as we used to call them at the time. So, and these one, this one here, this object here, in itself is not a character. You have to think of it uh, as being a common factor, which when multiplied by q to some power of h, h being an eigenvalue of L0, will give you a character. And this power of q is actually encoded in this function of tau here, which I've written here, right? So A of tau is a, a power series in Q, and each time that you fix n here, Q to this fixed n times this object there is an n equals 4 characters. 
right? So it is a decomposition in n equals 4 characters. And these numbers are the magic numbers that I was talking about before, right? Now, let's talk about them, then I will come back to this. Uh, for 20 years, almost, we didn't know what to do with these numbers. And then Eguchi and Ogui and Tashika were, were in Aspen one summer, and uh, Toru, I understand, uh, knew something about um, K3 surfaces, of course, but also about the group of symplectic automorphisms of, of K3. And all of these groups are subgroups of uh, M23, so the sporadic group uh, uh, Mathieu 23. So he opened the atlas with these other two uh, friends there, and they looked at the uh, character table for M23, and things didn't quite fit. Uh, they, they found in the characters for the identity, which is the dimension of the representation, they found numbers that were reminiscent of these ones, but not quite. And then they had this uh, genial idea to go and look at M24. And there, clack, 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 they found that 90 is twice 45, and 45 is one of the irreducible representation of M24. 462 is twice 231, and 231 is a, an irreducible representation of M24, and so on and so forth. Of course, there are only 26 irreducible representation of M24. This is an infinite series. So what happens after a while is that you get reducible representations, but you can always decompose them, of course, in re irreducible ones. And if you do this for long enough, you see that all the irreducible representations come in, right? So, and that was proven by Garnon, right? So there's a mathematical proof that these numbers here are really to do with M24 and nothing else. So this is so still... Multiplicities? Or multiplicities uh, yes, there, there can be multiplicities. I, as, as, yes, if you, if you go far away, these numbers grow very fast here, right? So you have only 26 building blocks, so they have to come with multiplicity. Uh, a synthetical expression for large N? You said there, are, there are asymptotic formulas for large N, for AN. You want to know AN, yes? Yes, there are. So Iguchi and Ikami have worked these things in the context of uh, uh, black holes and uh, entropy. Sorry? You will not tell me that's the formula, right? I'm not going to. I'm not going to use it. I'm sorry. It's mm. a disappointment. Oh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Uh, I, I can talk to you privately afterwards and show you nice formulas. Mm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> OK. So uh, terminology here. In this elliptic genus, actually, because of this Y bar being one, it means that you project into a sector which is short representation on the right or massless, while on the left I haven't done anything to the Y on the left, so I, I get a mix of massless and massive. Right? What I call quarter BPS here are basically states which are massive on the left and massless on the right. So it's not the full BPS spectrum here, but only part of it. Right? But this sector here, as I said, is encoded into this part, and this minus two here is, uh, is not a clean business yet. I mean, so people think that might involve virtual representations of M24, but uh, we haven't studied that yet. Right, so this phenomenon here is called Mathieu Moonshine, right? because these are coefficients of a mock modular form, Right, and then suddenly the number theorists got interested. Uh, but it, it's linked to group theory and to string theory in a way that nobody expected, right? Right, so then we have... Sorry, and yes? the minus two is not simply a fermionic uh, representation? Uh, yes, let me see. So the minus two, it, it has to do with the vacuum in the Neveu-Schwarz sector. Right but now, you, know, you you get signs because of the of the right. grading. That's true, but it, the, the story is much more complicated than just uh, counting of fermions and bosons. The, the understanding of this, mm -hmm. right? It's the Witten index of this representation, the vacuum representation. But you say the minus two is mysterious. The, the fact that that in the decomposition here, if you want to reinterpret in terms of uh, of uh, let's say. 
n equals 4 characters, you are forced into this pattern here with a minus sign there. Yeah, and it is, it is intrinsically due to this, but we don't understand the meaning. But these are not representation of M24, you see? 20, even if you, if you take plus 2 here, okay, you can say it's 1 plus 1, but it's not that. So it's, uh, it's mysterious. No, nobody understands that. So the first 26 terms is twice dimension of representation. It is, and that's... Then after that... As well, always. It's always an twice, even number. Twice, but twice. combination. Yes. It's always twice. And the twice is because you have the, the representation, it's complex conjugate. So when you say 90, it's 45 plus 45 bar. Ah. And of course, some representations are real, so there you have a multiplicity too. Right? And this is proven as well. So the, the people prove that... All the, the, the entries are integers, that uh, they are even and positive. So all this is under control. And it's a mock modular form. Whatever this is, this is not the, the, the talk today. Right, so now, to be clear on notations here, because I'm going to use them again, what I, I'm writing as curly edge BPS is the space of states of quarter BPS, so all the ones that appear here. And this is in a subspace, and there's an injection here, into the space of generic, spa uh, the space of generic states that I've introduced before in the elliptic uh, genus here. Why is it just an injection here? Because this space here also counts things which come from here. So that's the link here. So I'm, I'm restricting myself today to this part of the story. And there's a color code here, which I hope will be uh, consistent, is that this violet color, purple color here, always has to do with the generic space of states, right? So if you see violet, so this is magenta, it's different, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, right. So generic and non-generic K3 theories, now if you, there is a notion of moduli space for uh, K3 theories, and we know very well one component. We think there is only one, but nobody has proven it again. But in that component, the landscape is well known of moduli, uh, moduli, the moduli space. And as you vary the moduli, so you go from one theory to the next, um, you have different behaviors. And although the generic states are common, to all the K3 theories, at certain points in the moduli space, you have uh, an enhancement of symmetry maybe, so you have more uh, quarter BPS states that are going to come in, and therefore, but, but these quarter BPS states that, that, that you have in surplus at some points happen to cancel uh, because of the uh, minus one to the J0 minus J0 bar. So um, that's what is the philosophy of this table here, is that if you have a generic K3 theory, then you don't have, at this particular point, uh, extra cancellations that happen, and that's what is written here. Now, if you are non-generic, and the Z2 or before conformal field theories are a class of such generic theories, then you have these uh, cancellations that happen in the elliptic genus, uh, but there are pluses and minus uh, in the two cases, so the plus sign for the uh, generic is that you don't have to worry about these extra cancellations, okay? And also uh, for, the, for, for the generic one, but on the other hand, nobody knows explicitly any of these theories, so <laughs> practically you can't do anything with them. On the other hand, the non-generic ones, well, uh, we know very well these ones, uh, they have the same spectrum uh, uh, of generic states, that's something that you can show, but there are cancellations, right? So uh, you have to kind of navigate between the two. And today I'm going to talk more about these ones. And my last transparency will be basically about the future. Right. So uh, to be clear again, in non-generic K3 theories, the space of massive quarter BPS states, ah, here I didn't put the color right, should be violet, is actually not the same space as the full space of quarter BPS states, because the full space here will involve the states that cancel in the elliptic genus, right? 
Okay, for example, in Z2 conformal field theory, or before the conformal field theories, you see that this is what the elliptic genus measures, the numbers, the magic numbers of before. But if you look at the dimension of these spaces here, okay, you see that they are higher each time. And if you go from 90s to 102, there are 12 states. Sorry, what exactly is this uh, HM straight HM plus captures so. This one here? No, no, lower, lower. Lower. Yeah. Here? This one here. Well, I'm going to, to say in a second. Okay. So here I'm, I'm, I'm to, I've not talked about H plus yet. I've just talked about these two. All right. Uh, and then you have 12 here at level one. And this is six fermions and six bosons that cancel in the elliptic genus, but they exist in the theory. Okay. Now this states, this space here uh, is actually what is left once you have taken away. So, so H plus at level one here would be the 12 I've just talked about. Okay, so this is what I call the excess states. So the, it's a bunch of fermions and bosons that cancel. Right, well, standard BPS, and then you get Z2 CFT, right? Consistency. Yeah, sorry? Uh, combined with this HBPS same, and then... Yes, and then you get, you get the whole state. Yes, absolutely. So it's just uh, the, um, selecting... Yeah. Right, so we don't know really what drives these cancellations and they, they just happen in the elliptic genus so we wanted to uh, understand this in a practical setting which are these Z2 orbifold uh, CFTs and very very quickly uh, I've jotted here uh, what will be uh, useful for later here is that uh, the construction of these uh, are from a uh, toroidal conformal field, uh, com super conformal field theory at central charge 6 and uh, this construction here is induced by uh, the Kummer construction of K3 surfaces. So uh, it's not uh, by, by chance that it's like this. It's that deep connections between the geometry and the conformal field theory there. So Kummer surfaces are a special class of K3 surfaces. And they start by taking a torus, T lambda, which is obviously given by a C2 modular mod a, a lattice, which has four real dimensions, right? So there's some geometry in here, and then we take a Z2 orbifold of this torus. In the process, we get fixed point, 16 of them, right? Uh, and therefore, all this is a different story from, from today's story, but uh, uh, it has to do these 16 fixed points in the conformal field theory language will correspond to the 16 twisted sectors of, uh, of the theory. So it's beautiful. And if we wanted a free field representation of the symmetry here for these theories here, uh, we can uh, achieve them by looking at uh, four Dirac fermions and their super partners. And then this is the realization of these generators of n equals four uh, in terms of these uh, free fields. Okay, I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. So you will see this transparency again decorated further later. Right. So, I'm after the elliptic genus in these theories, so I start with the partition function. And I've chosen to work in the Neuveschwart sector, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the remarks I will make at the end uh, connect directly to the Neuveschwart sector. However, in n equals 4, the Neuveschwart and the Pramon sector are isomorphic to each other. So, you don't lose or you don't win information, it's just a repackaging. Uh, with, of course, a, a different physical interpretation. Right. So the partition function in the Neuveschwart sector, uh, typically in these orbifold theories, have an untwisted sector. So this is a schematic to uh, indicate the uh, boundary conditions in the tau and the sigma directions, right? So uh, we, we have an untwisted and a twisted sector. And uh, if we are interested uh, in the generic states of the theory, then we have to remove in the full partition function here whatever depends on the moduli. And it turns out that the moduli dependence is all in the un untwisted sector. And remember, it's a, conform a toroidal conformal field theory, so it comes from a torus and story, uh, you know, the hind lattice and so on. So the, the moduli are really in that part of the theory. So I'm going to set the momentum and the winding number of the states to zero. Because 
if I don't keep, if I keep them, then I keep a dependence on the moduli because this change. So this is what I call a generic partition function. And in terms of the uh, elliptic genus expressed in the Neuve-Schwartz sector, it can be expressed in terms of generating functions for the twisted. So this is the twisted, uh, sorry, untwisted, red is untwisted, and this is twisted. They are written in terms of uh, Jacobi theta functions again, and usual things. You have to keep uh, modes, uh, modes, uh, not modes, uh, states, uh, of course, which are either bosonic or fermionic. Uh, the details are in the paper, but it's not interesting for us today. But it turns out that uh, mathematically, these three generating functions can be decomposed, as, as we know, because this is elliptic genus, into n equals four representations again, right? So this is basically a slightly rewritten version of the elliptic genus from the point of view of the Neuve-Schwartz sector. But here, it's the same function as before, because the spectral flow that allows you to go from Neuve-Schwartz to Hamon uh, is actually an operation that uh, affects the y dependence of your, <coughs> of your object, right? And this a of tau function obviously doesn't depend on y, right? So it's not going to move uh, through the spectral flow. So it's no surprise that even in this repackaging here, you see the same numbers uh, as before, right? So now we are looking at this and, right, it's a little bit more involved here, but I hope that I can make myself clear. So it's color-coded. <laughs> so we already know that the purple here is for generic states. The red ones are the untwisted sector, the number of states in the untwisted sector, and the blue ones are the number of states in the twisted sector, right? So this is, you have seen this, so our ansatz is that this expression that you have seen before, so these are all the quarter BPS uh, massive that I was looking at. These are the excess states that we talked about. And now what I say is that within this class of states, I have two contribution, right? And I have to explain to you what these two contributions are in a minute. But let's keep it just as a formal uh, exercise for a minute. Uh, then uh, you have all the ingredients which are written here right? And why do I call this first one H n perp? Now, very briefly, I told you that all this is linked to the 16 fixed point in the Kummer construction. And then you have 16 twisted sectors in the conformal field theory. In this 16 dimensional space, I can identify a very symmetric direction Okay, and how do I do this? Well, I know that on this <coughs> twisted space, I have an action of a geometric group. This geometric group being uh, linked to the geometry of the torus lambda, uh, sorry, the, the torus T lambda, you know, the lambda, the, the lattice I use for my torus in the Kummer construction as some geometric symmetries. And after a, a few steps, Basically, the arch, the off, 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 the upshot, or whatever, of, of all this construction is that on the twisted space, this geometric group acts. And if you take a, a sum of all the grand, grand states of these twisted sectors, and you sum them, then under the action of the group, it's an invariant, because the geometric group acts as permutation of these. Uh, ground state, so the typical construction, you take the sum. So this is what I call the diagonal direction. So in my 16 dimensional twisted space there, I have a direction which is my diagonal one and then I have everything else which is orthogonal to it. And that's the perp there. So the perp there is a 15 dimensional space there in terms of the ground states in the twisted sector. And I've chosen to write it as 15 contribution of one sector here. And the diagonal one, in a minute, we are going to split it again a little bit. The rest, the rest here, is basically the leftover quarter BPS states that are not, that are generic. 
Okay, so all this is HBPS, right? These are the excess states. So that's how it is. And of course, I have at my disposal uh, the, the dimensions of, of three uh, objects, CN, BN, and DN, right? And what, why is this an ansatz? Is that by looking at the first two levels, so n equals one and n equals two, uh, we have noticed that actually uh, it's, it seems, right? Ah, okay, sorry. Oh, right? <laughs> so what I was saying here, so, so basically here, what, what we know for sure is that a, a certain subclass of untwisted states automatically comes into the excess because basically they come uh, with a minus sign, say, and uh, there are less of them at each n than the dns, the dns. So uh, we know that they are here. What we don't know is how, uh, what the partners of these states are in H plus to cancel. They could come from CN or DN, right? And the answer is that none of the untwisted ones are partnering in the two BNs in the excess sector, right? So this remains to be proven for general N, but it turns out that Keller and Zade recently have shown that for N equals one, in a way, uh, it's not so difficult there because for C1 here, C1 is zero, so obviously they are not. So what they've shown is that anything uh, in, in the uh, excess sector here was actually uh, lifting off the BPS bound when you deform the theory. So you go away from the Kummer point, you introduce CFT def deformations, and then these states don't stay BPS, right? So therefore they are not generic, right? So that's, that's the, the, the Let's say what's behind all this. Is there a general formula for all, uh, some nice formula for each excess? We, we, have an, we have a function, so the generating function of before, u l0, u l1 half in t that I wrote, you have a, 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 a closed it form. It contains for it, of course, but it's uh, just for excess, excess numbers. For the excess numbers, uh, yes, you can, you, you, you can, you have a number, but you don't know. So it's all about numbers at this stage, okay? But you, you need to know what the states themselves are, because if it's just a number, you just know it's a boson or a fermion. But for example, in terms of the uh, free fermions and free, free bosons that I showed you before, uh, what are they? Yeah, we wanted to understand a little bit more closely the nature of these states, not apart from the fact that, apart from their statistics, we wanted to know how that. So we did an explicit construction for n equals one and n equals two. N equals one is a piece of cake, but n equals two is what we did in uh, in Stony Brook last uh, spring. Uh, Catherine and I were there, and we just sweated <laughs> over this because I will tell you why it was complicated. But anyway, so this is this. This is because we, had, we didn't have a better idea. We, we really wanted to see, okay, what are these states? Not just there are fermions or numbers of fermions or bosons. What are they? Okay, so we did that. Okay, so I think the time is running, isn't it? You have uh, 12 minutes. 12, okay. Yes. So, so I think I'm going to skip this one, but uh, not go into the details of it. But basically at level one, uh, this we did a few years ago already, we noticed that uh, all the states that are generic, okay, actually fit into representations, not of M24, I mean, it's the space is the same for an M24 representation, but it's a representation of a maximal subgroup of M24. Now, why is this maximal subgroup of M24 uh, so exciting to us? It's what we call G octad here right? It's z to the 4 semi-direct product with the alternate group of eight <coughs> elements there. Uh, it's because it comes from our idea of symmetry surfing, okay? So in words, symmetry surfing is that you have uh, a space, and this is going to be the generic space of states that I'm talking about, uh, where everything, which is common to all K3 theories, right? And then 
if you travel from one point in that moduli space to another one, the symmetries are different. The, the geometric symmetries are different because you have different tori that you play with. And therefore what you do is that you collect all the symmetries at the different points, all the geometric symmetries, and therefore you obtain this G octad. So uh, there is circumstantial evidence that it's not such a stupid idea, right? But again, I mean, it's just evidence so far and it's no, not proven that it's really what's going to happen in this problem, right? But at least we have this group to hook on. And uh, it turns out that at level one, we see very clearly because we, have, we had the help of Margolin, who is a group theorist, who had written a paper ages ago about the 45 dimensional representation of M24. And the way he constructed it was very helpful in order to, uh, to make this statement there. But again, I don't have the time to go into the details here. And then, apart from Keller and Zade that really confirmed what, what we expected at level one, Gab uh, Gabardil, uh, Keller and Paul also did a very fine piece of group theory there, a uh, very elegant paper, where they actually say that not only, whoops, here, okay? So not only the, the octad group acts on H perp, which is all you could see at level one, but they looked at all levels, and they see that the octad group act on this space, but also on all the other massive quarter BPS states here that you have at your disposal in the generic space of states, right? So again, it's evidence that the symmetry surfing idea is not dead yet, right? But again, I'm, I'm being cautious here, right? Uh, so this, I think I said one way or the other. So basically, uh, what, what we did in order to, uh, to, to get more feel is to construct the states, but we've used an extra ingredient. And the extra ingredient is to uh, utilize the fact that in the building blocks of the Z2 or before superconformer field theories here, the building blocks also have a certain behavior under an SU2 group. Now, this is a global SU2, it's not... Uh, it's, it's a global SU2 and it's actually a subgroup of the uh, global SO4 that is common to all n equals 4 superconformal algebras here. And uh, they transform as doublets under uh, this SU2 and we've kind of implemented this uh, refinement in the generating functions U and T that I had before. So we have introduced another complex number there okay, to keep track of this global SU2. And what we found in doing this is that very explicitly up to here, so for one and two, so you can obviously make predictions from the uh, analytic expressions of the generating functions that you have here, but for these two uh, levels here, we have uh, painstakingly computed, calculated all the states, so these 16 states here and these 28 states here, explicitly in terms of the building blocks and identify their behave, the behavior under the SU2. So how do they decompose? So if I take this 16 here, how do they decompose under this SU2? And the notation here is that we have the multiplicity here. So it's two triplets here and two uh, quintets, right? So two times three plus two times five is 16, yes? And, and so on and so forth. So we've done this for the three uh, generating functions that I showed you before. And what we see is that uh, what the excess states that we wanted to, to cancel here, they are six plus six, the 12 that I talked about before. Now, you had no choice at level one, I said, because there's nothing in the rest here. So this CN is in the rest. So all the cancellations have to come from the D if you uh, uh, agree with me that all the BNs are in the excess and come with a minus size. So, and then we have a minus two, remember? It was minus two BN. So we have minus two singlet under this SU2, and here you have two singlets in the DN. So it seems that the SU2 uh, behavior of the states 
is a guiding principle to see where the cancellations have to come from. So you see at the second level, in CN, so in the <laughs> untwisted sector, you have no singlets of this SU2 that you could use to cancel twice a singlet here. On the other hand, in the DN, you have two of these singlets, just two, just lucky, and therefore you cancel them. So again, uh, it's an observation, and as you go along in, in the levels, it becomes a little bit more ambiguous, because let's see, I think if I come to this level here for sure, we have enough in the C sector, then in the untwisted sector, to cancel the one there. Here you don't have enough. You, you would need three to the six here, yeah? Uh, here you have enough. Okay, so even here, here you have enough, okay? So, again, we have unfortunately no uh, confirmation uh, from proper deformation theory that our idea is absolutely correct at all level at this, at this time. Uh, what Keller and Zade that did for the level one, now, with, with, with our latest work here, we have prepared the way in order to do the same exercise at level two. But uh, second order perturbation theory and conformal field theory, yes, uh, is, is technically quite involved and maybe we should have a better idea, which is uh, a little bit what I'm going to talk about next. Right, so, yeah. Right, so this is uh, a different level of thought here. Right, and uh, it's it's uh, it's actually the, the novelty on this transparency is actually due to Catherine here, in here, and uh, almost simultaneously there was a paper by Bailin Son, who is a mathematician, uh, who published uh, quite a difficult paper to read, but which basically arrives at the same conclusion as Catherine, who has published this uh, uh, in CMP. Right. So what is this? Well, I've talked a lot about the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus. It's been known since Witten and Erste Broek that it's actually for K3 surfaces, it's equal to the uh, complex uh, uh, elliptic genus. Okay, so this is a, the, there's a link between the geometry uh, and the conformal field theory at this level, right? And in some incarnation, this elliptic genus, uh, in terms of uh, uh, tangent bundles, and here uh, I've taken a short curtain because we don't have the time to, to go into this. Uh, I, I can only say in words what this TLM is, but it's coming from looking at, first of all, the basic ingredient is going to be the tangent bundle of uh, the manifold X, so T10, right? And then there is a virtual bundle, so it's a formal sum of bundles that are constructed by taking the exterior product of the T-bundle, so the tangent bundle, times uh, exterior product of the dual tangent bundle, times the symmetric pro product of the tangent bundle, times the symmetric product of the dual tangent bundle. So it's quite a sophisticated object, but that has been studied at length in, in the literature. And that virtual bundle that I didn't write for you here, you can recast it as, a, as, a, as an infinite sum here in two variables where L goes from zero to infinity while M here is bounded between the dimension and minus the dimension of your manifold here. And it's a power, a formal power series in the variables Y and Q that we are familiar with. And this is the, Euler the holomorphic Euler characteristic of this bundle that I've constructed uh, the way I said before. Anyway, so this is the expression and then in 2016 Kakru and Tripathi had a quite a good idea. They said okay since the cancellations of states in the uh, conformal field theoretic elliptic genus is a pain because we don't really see what's going on, let's try to lift this, com this cancellation and introduce um, a, a new uh, grading which is V here, in the right sector. So somehow reinstating a little bit of the partition function thing there, right? And they did that. Uh, and then they also showed uh, that uh, you have the, a counterpart in the geometry, except that you can show that these two objects don't agree. Here they agree, here they never agree, 
right? So that's the first remark. And then there is much more to this, uh, that this object might not be actually that helpful in the problem at hand where we want to understand Matthew Moonshine, right? And then what Catherine uh, has, uh, has observed is that now instead of taking the trace just over the, the kernel of T bar zero, right? She introduces as these two a grading, but she just traces over the generic states. So the generic states being a subset, a subspace of the cur, right? And the inspiration for this is that Caspar uh, Kapustin, and I forgot to put his name here because it was quite crucial, in 2005, he had this idea that if you take the infinite volume limit of a nonlinear sigma model with a topological twist, then you get uh, the cohomology of the chiral Durham complex, as this paper. And this is exactly where we are, is that you can define a, a new elliptic genus that she calls the Hodge chiral here, which basically uh, has to do with taking the trace over the group, cohomology group here, of the chiral Durham complex. Okay, now again, very vaguely, since I don't have time, for K3 uh, surfaces, these two can be shown to agree. So this is equal to this. It's an invariant, you can show that, right? And uh, there is a structure. This chiral Durham complex is a so-called sheaf of uh, super vertex operator algebras, which have to do with the BC beta gamma system. So there is a structure of VOA there. For the Mathieu moonshine, we also would like to see a VOA structure on which the Mathieu group 24 acts. Okay? We don't see it, but we think that this chiral Durham complex here and the sheaf cohomology of it are going to be a mathematical object that models the generic spaces of states uh, in, in, in the K3 theories. And if we can find more structure on it, then maybe we will see M24 acting on that extra structure. That, that's, that's the direction of travel. Right. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm at the end here. So Ah, I didn't tell you that. Is, uh, yes, that's a little remark. I put it there because I knew I was going not to say it. <laughs> is that um, it turns out that if you take complex tori, so T's for tori, ah. these three quantities are equal. So when I say that this is not equal to this one, it's, it's for, for tori it happens to be true, but it's, uh, it's not where we want to be. K3, it's not true. And that's probably why at the beginning, People thought that this would be the way to go for Mathieu Munchan because they saw it worked for Torah. But if you really calculate things for K3, then there is a differentiation there. So, so basically, uh, that's, that's now where we concentrate our efforts, is trying to understand more about the Karen Durham complex. Right, so this was, oops. Okay, I'll spare you the conclusion because I'm, I'm out of time, I'm sure. So this. Yeah. This is for Samson because it's his <laughs> birthday. Now, um, I wanted to put something from Belgium because I'm Belgian, right? And like, it's not clear from my name, but that's what I am. And in Belgium, we like to say things with cartoons. You know, we're very much into cartoons. <laughs> uh, this guy called Geluk, okay? Geluk, we say in French, is, is also known in France, by the way. And he has this series of uh, snapshots with some philosophical uh, thoughts, which uh, you know, usually are quite thought-provoking, which in, in with, a, with, a, with a cat, that's a cat, yes, so see that. And of course he speaks French, but you understand French, of course, yeah. yes. Okay. So, okay, and there's a little message there, it's about saving the planet, of course, so we won't have uh, 60 candles on your cake just to save the planet. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. Questions? Yeah? Yes? No. <laughs> yeah. no, it's just a very general question. From this very old time, about 88 or something like this, there's also a suggestion of written 
this should be some 24 dimensional uh, and Hirschelbrook at the same time should be 24 dimensional real manifold with action of a monster such uh, and this 24 dimensional manifold should have elliptic genus with to the j function uh -huh. and so on get geometric realization of monster representations uh, directly in index of Dirac operator so uh, there's really no progress after that but no. do people do physicists have any idea whether it should be true or not no, well, personally, I don't. I, I never really looked. Uh, I know that, uh, I mean, it's kind of expected that because M24 is a big stepping stone in constructing the monster, that there should be a link, a, a deeper link that we have not grasped yet between the monster moonshine and this one. Uh, but I've not really looked at all into that direction. So uh, I know that I mean, there are other people working on Matthew Moonshine. Or, uh, what I didn't say is that there are now more and more instances of moonshines where you have automorphic forms whose coefficients have to do with the dimensions of some representations of some groups, yes? Uh, so, so there are fascinating things happening, but no, I don't know. I don't know more. Basically, I've told you where I am. <laughs> and very much Mathieu, uh, very much K3 for me. So yeah, my question is, it seems like you can still get quite a bit of information without going the conformal field theory. For instance, you have this space of states 192 or 100. So how can you know this without knowing what the CFD is? For instance, you know, you remember you had this A, I think it was the number of BPS, yes. called the BPS states. Yeah. Although you don't know. So how but because the, the elliptic genus is invariant over the whole space, so... How do you know that? I mean, if you it's prove, it's, well, you can prove that the elliptic genus is, is, is doesn't depend on the moduli at all. So, but if you cannot compute it in any CFD, because I think you can, you can on, on Z two or befalls, you can. It's it's a special case, yes. so you can calculate the elliptic genus. But if you go away from the orbifold point, <coughs> you still have ah point. away from the orbifold point. No, I, 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 we we can't compu compute anything. <laughs> Apart, we can t kind of perturb a little bit and see what's happening. But you knew, for instance, the dimension of, of this H0, of whatever it was, was 100 <coughs> at n equal 1. Yes. You know, have, so this you were able to infer, nevertheless, even though, even away from the orbifold point, it seems to me. Yes, but, but we did calculate it from an orbit. We did, the, the calculation I did with Eguchi in 1988 was in, in the framework of Z2 or before, the Gapner models. So, yeah, okay. so you calculate, because it's an invariant over the whole space, you can choose a point when you know how to calculate. And, and these numbers that you are talking about are spitted out at this particular point. And because you can prove it's an invariant, then even if you don't know the theory, you know that these will be the same numbers. What you don't know is the number of excess states. So the number of excess states vary from one theory to the next, but in, in the conformal field uh, theoretical, in the CFT elliptic genus, they cancel. Okay. Yeah? And are you sure the theory exists? Which you theory? The, I mean, the superconformal theory, you, which you <laughs> cannot construct. I mean, because don't you assume it exists just to prove that? Uh, just to know. <coughs> you are a mathematician. Uh, so. uh, yeah. I, uh, uh, well, there is, well, the moduli space is 80 dimensional. That, that's proven mathematically, right? So you can't exhaust the set of theories with only the few Gepner models, which are isolated points, and the class of Z2 or before. So I think what the shape is of these K3 theories, nobody knows. Uh, well, at least I don't know. I don't know. Maybe other people have ideas. But. This magic numbers has lower index n. Can you write recursion relation? No. No. Asymptotic formulas, yes. So he won't do the asymptotic formula from you. Sorry? In the beginning, asymptotic yes, formula. yes. That that uh, Eguchi and Ikami, I I'm sure I can find a paper here if you want, if you're interested. Yeah. Yes, they 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 looked in um, connection with the entropy of black holes. And factorial? <laughs> it's, it's complicated, but then I'm sure there are some <laughs> factors. I don't know. I, I don't remember. <laughs> yes. Yes. I had a question about this Hodge elliptic yes. thing. If we look at this, when Kachu and... Uh, yeah, Kachu and Tipati. They, yeah. they, they uh, proposed it, but then we didn't know how to make sense of it, because I think there was something that was not clear that it was a BPS uh, condition. Because indeed we want to relate it to counting of black holes. Where you have spin yes. black holes, yes. which is kind of natural. Yes. 
but also we wanted to generalize the, um, pro the product form <coughs> to a symmetric product, so mm -hmm. three, mm -hmm. because then you expect also some connection with um, Siegel model reform, things like that. Okay. Is that yes. known anything? Because I mean, this new definition that, that yes. Wendell gave is that different? I mean, from the it's a different object, is it? It's a completely different object. For example, it relates. Uh, let me see. Um, Right, so th th there's also uh, several, or at least one paper by uh, Kreuzig and Hearn that have looked quite deeply into the Hodge elliptic genus and they've tried, they've tried to, um, so, so, so they looked, they looked and they found that in there, um, there are some, now, now I'm getting a bit out of my depth here, but there are some global uh, section, holomorphic sections that are not n equals 4 in there. And therefore, it, while for the Carol Durham one, Song, this yeah. Bailing Song, has shown that the global holomorphic sections are all n equals 4 only. Only. So that's one way to differentiate the two. It's also that Kapustin really points into the, the direction that uh, the, 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 the topologically twisted, half twisted nonlinear sigma model has to do with the uh, cohomology of the of the Carol the, the RAM, nothing to do with the cohomology of this bundle that you're talking about. So it, it, it's intrinsically a new a new object. Uh, you can't really calculate things in the conformal field theory side because this is the state of generic the space of generic states. This is really you saw. So it has a geometric definition. So, so the, the, the geometric definition, which agrees with the conformal field theoretic one, okay. uh, that's proven, Catherine proves it, but we need to study more uh, looking for M24 there okay. uh, in, in, in the geometric part, because I think it's quite powerful if we can find it there. Yeah. You, s you saw with the Z2 or before, it's a bit painful. <laughs> yeah. There was some variation on the theme uh, by Shamit and I think Miranda Chang involving special holonomy in case. No? Yes. yes. Any comment on I mean, no. how does it come up that in, in case three I understand all this? No, I, 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 don't, I haven't read this paper. I know they exist, but. Uh, yeah. there, were, there were some papers about a couple of years ago, suddenly yeah. G2 came up, and this uh, M24 is replaced by something. And well, I thought they only can realize subgroups of M24. I thought was the presence. No, it, but it, it algebra came. It, it was not a joint. It was in the in the G2 and spin 7 is this algebra I had with Wafa. They used an algebra which which looks like that and constructed something. I tried to read, I could not understand so many. <laughs> no, I haven't read these ones. I mean, uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Next time. Maybe it's a good time to break for lunch. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.